I think that readers of my book will be really surprised to hear this new theory that Shakespeare's plays were based on earlier plays by another playwright and all that that has to say about their their meanings and, and their themes that could help us read Shakespeare's plays in new ways. That's author Michael Blanding speaking about his latest book, North by Shakespeare, a rogue scholar's quest for the truth behind the Bard's work. Michael joins us to discuss an unusual journey through Tudor London, Renaissance France and Italy, and modern technology to trace Dennis McCarthy's claims about Thomas North and the plays of William Shakespeare. While meeting his friends Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and the players, Hamlet assures them and the audience that he is but, quote, mad north-northwest, feigning madness for his so-called uncle father and aunt mother. I couldn't help but remember that phrase, mad north-northwest, when I met the Norths, a family of political operatives in Tudor times, and possibly a new source for Shakespeare's plays. For the past 15 years, self-taught scholar Dennis McCarthy has devoted his energies to exploring the links between Shakespeare's plays and Thomas North's published and unpublished writings. McCarthy has relied on plagiarism software and an exhaustive review of North's life to find some surprising parallels to the plays we know so well. Michael Blanding's new book, North by Shakespeare, A Rogue Scholar's Quest for the Truth Behind the Bard's Work, explores McCarthy's research and the connections he makes. From North's relationship with Robert Dudley to his travels through France and Italy, Blanding reveals the multiple connections between a Tudor political figure and the world's best-known and most beloved playwright. Blanding is a Boston-based investigative journalist and an award-winning author. I'm delighted to welcome Michael to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Let's start by laying the groundwork about how McCarthy's provocative assertions might strike Shakespeare's devoted fan. I know that I have some listeners who are pretty big Shakespeare fans. And in April, I've been talking about Shakespeare on the podcast and doing some social media, and I always get a lot of comments and a lot of feedback. And so we have some fans here, and I wonder what you might say to fans who believe that the man from Stratford, Shakespeare, wrote the plays, do you think this raises authorship questions that might bother those people? Or do you see it more as a a different and, and maybe more complete way of understanding Shakespeare, this person and how he wrote the plays? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I I know that people take their Shakespeare very seriously and they take him very personally, as I have uh, gotten uh, many of those same questions and comments myself uh, since I published the book. But what's really interesting about the book that I wrote and about the scholar that I profile in the book, Dennis McCarthy, is that he is not saying that someone else wrote the plays. He is saying that uh, William Shakespeare, the man from Stratford, the uh, of the Lord Chamberlain's men, uh, actually wrote and produced the plays. What he is saying that is different and new, and I think exciting, is that Shakespeare based many of his works on the previous work of an earlier playwright, Thomas North, and. He took these plays and uh, adapted them and changed them and and made them his own. But it really explains a lot of these mysteries about the plays that we've spent so many years uh, trying to understand and that has given rise to all of these conspiracy theories about another writer, about how Shakespeare could know about travel in Italy or know complex legal jargon or uh, the, the vernacular of a soldier in war. And so... I like to think of it as really deepening the understanding of the plays and, and adding new insights rather than than replacing uh, Shakespeare as, as the author. Okay, great. I really appreciate your saying that because I do know that people do have very strong and personal feelings, as you say, and I love the way that you've sort of 
reached out to those dedicated Shakespeare fans and reassured them that, in fact, yes, this recognizes and in a lot of ways, I felt reinforces the idea that this man without a huge education that we might recognize or a lot of travel would be able to know those things. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm going to push just a little and sure. ask you about Dennis McCarthy. And he, he, what kind of evidence is he giving us? What kind of evidence did he share with you? What kind of evidence do you think is compelling to see this in a new way, to see these plays in a new way? Yeah. So Dennis McCarthy is a really fascinating character. And I first met him about six years ago when he approached me after a, a book reading that I gave. And, you know, he told me uh, in brief about this theory about Shakespeare and this earlier playwright, Thomas North. And at first I had the same reaction that probably a lot of your listeners have uh, just, you know, no way. This is some, uh, you know, really outlandish theory and, and uh, you know, it, it, it can't be true. And then he started sending me this evidence that he had uncovered. And um, so Dennis is not a, a traditional scholar. He's, he's, uh, uh was actually a college dropout. He sort of um, uh, trained himself in a whole number of disciplines and, and has published academic papers in science and, and started looking into the Shakespeare question about 15 years ago. And one of the novel things that he has done is he has used computer software this plagiarism software that compares Shakespeare's plays to the, the works of this other writer, Sir Thomas North, who wrote a series of translations um, in, um, in the 16th century. And he came across just literally thousands of phrases that Shakespeare used in the plays that, that North had also used in his writing. And they weren't just sort of randomly distributed throughout the plays and throughout these translations, but they were actually grouped in similar contexts. They were re relating to similar ideas, similar themes, similar characters. And um, so that was kind of the first indication that he had that maybe there was more of a connection between Shakespeare and, and Thomas North than, than had been previously known about. But then as he started doing more research, he started finding um, all of these other elements uh, that in Thomas North's life that related to the plays in these really uncanny ways. And he uncovered two manuscripts that, that Shakespeare scholars had, had never even known about that, that seemed to, to relate to the plays and, and uh, all of these uh, references um, by other writers that, that seemed to point to this connection between North and Shakespeare. And so he really came at it from about four or five different angles at once and, and was able to pinpoint each play to a particular time and a particular um, uh, issue or preoccupation that, that I found just to be really compelling. That's great. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your helping us see that world in a way through Dennis McCarthy's eyes as a non-traditional scholar. In fact, he reminds me a bit of Shakespeare in that way, you know, <laughs> the non-traditional playwright, the non-scholarly playwright. Right. But the character of, of Thomas North and his family are fascinating to me. And I was so intrigued in a time in the Tudor period and into the early Stuart, but especially in the Tudor period, Thomas and his father, Edward, seem to be uncannily successful in navigating politics in a tumultuous time. And I just wonder, what do you think made that family so adept at surviving when regimes would change or, you know, Henry the eighth within his own regime changed his mind quite a few times. <laughs> and yet the North seemed to keep coming out on top. How did they do that? I just found that <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, it was really fascinating to me as well. Um, you know, just to give you some, some context, you know, Thomas North, he's probably best known as the translator of the book Plutarch's Lies. So he's, he's really known as, as a writer, but his father, Edward was uh, a, a politician and and a lord in the time of of Henry the Eighth, uh, he was the Chancellor of Augmentations, which was uh, the sort of in charge of the dissolution of the monasteries that um, you know really tore down um, a lot of these edifices of of the Catholic Church, and so he became sort of fabulously wealthy uh, in that role. But then he was also just uh, incredibly adept at sort of riding these waves of different. Um, 
political movements and different religious movements that uh, that occurred at that time. Um, when uh, Henry VIII died and Edward VI took the throne, he was um, uh, a, a compatriot of, of John Dudley, who sort of took power at that time, but he, he knew enough to kind of switch sides right before uh, Jane Grey took the throne and, and uh, Mary uh, came to power. And then he became a um, actually a persecutor of Protestants. He was on this uh, uh, heresy commission under, under Queen Mary, and, and she uh, rewarded him by making him a baron. And, and he seemed to be just very changeable in his religious uh, viewpoints and really willing to kind of uh, sway with the times. And uh, there must have just been something about his uh, ability with, uh, with language and, and to you know, say the right thing to the right person at the, at the, the right time to maintain uh, his favor and, and really prosper throughout this period. So it was really fascinating for me to learn about. Well, I, I really enjoy you explaining that because as I was reading the book. And one of the things I loved about it is I felt like I was reading familiar stories, you know, with um, Henry's reign and then Edward's reign and then the end of Edward's reign and Jane Grey and Mary. Mm -hmm. So these are stories I know, but I'm seeing them through different eyes because I'm looking at the way Edward North is navigating his life and his power structure in all these ways. It was just fabulous and he seems like just such a success such a su survivor but not just to survive to succeed and thrive in all these different regimes and i wonder if you think that might have contributed to his son's fascination as i look at thomas mm. and he's part of this group of men who were educa educated at the ends of court and so they really sort of delve into the history and to looking at the history. And of course, I'm sure he's heard stories from his father, right? And the idea with what makes a good ruler, I wonder if you see a connection between father and son. It was almost if the father, Edward, lived through all these rulers to assess what makes a good ruler. And then his son was very interested in writing about, in, in exploring in that way, what makes a good ruler. So can you tell me a little bit about that connection? Cause I found that really interesting. Yeah, no, it, you're, you're exactly right. And, and I found that really fascinating as well, that Thomas North was a member of the Inns of Courts where of course uh, English drama got its start, but also it was a place where there were all of these uh, books and, and, and tracks that were being written about rulership and really struggling with this question of, what makes a, a good ruler and what makes a, a bad ruler. And the most famous book of, of the period was The Mirror for Magistrates, which was this sort of collective project that a lot of different people worked on. But Thomas North was working on his own translations. And you could really say that every one of the books that we know about that he wrote was, was consumed with this question. And um, his first one was called The Dial of Princes. And it was this sort of instruction manual for, for princes about, you know, how they could rule well. His second book was this um, sort of strange book of animal fables called The Moral Philosophy of Dhoni. But it was uh, sort of conceived as this, uh, again, this tract on rulership. And so through these different animal stories, you got to see which of the animals were actually good at, at, <laughs> at holding power and which weren't. And there's this whole rebellion that takes place where this mule tries to depose this <laughs> lion. And, and so again, he's sort of, you know, consumed with this question. And then Plutarch's Lives, which is really the entire book is contrasting these Roman rulers with these Greek rulers and not saying one is necessarily better than the others, but it's really trying to paint these portraits of them and through the stories about them, uh, just say something about, um, you know, how to rule well or how to be a good uh, military general or, or philosopher. And so it, uh, if you read, uh, and so if you read Shakespeare's plays, you see, the plays are obsessed with these very same questions and not just in the English histories, but in the Roman plays and in tragedies like Hamlet and Macbeth and King Lear. And even in comedies like As You Like It or The Tempest, there's always rulers that are getting deposed and rebellions that are being plotted and examples of kings that you know either rule wisely or rule terribly. And so seeing the plays through this lens uh, really kind of opened up, you know, entirely new uh, ways to, to read them for me and really made me kind of 
see these pre preoccupations that Thomas North had reflected in, in these, these stories that Shakespeare was putting on stage. Okay, let's turn to some times we can put North and other well-known characters in the same place. For example, there are times in Elizabeth's reign in particular where you see a connection with North and I'll mention first the Earl of Leicester, Elizabeth's yes. great friend, the Earl of Leicester and his attempts to perhaps marry the queen. We know he wanted to marry the queen. And then when she wouldn't marry him to derail other marriage opportunities. <laughs> right. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this was a really fascinating aspect of, of my research and, and of Dennis McCarthy's theories about Thomas North and one that I really enjoyed exploring in the book. But um, the Earl of Leicester, Robert Dudley, was North's patron, actually. He dedicated uh, several of his works to him. And he was actually best friends with North's brother, Roger North, who was uh, sort of his uh, his faithful friend. And he was at his secret wedding to Lettuce Knowles. And and mm. uh, uh, so they were very tight. The whole family was very tight with the, with the Dudleys. And um, as McCarthy started researching the plays and seeing them through the eyes of Thomas North, he began identifying all of these references to this question of who is Elizabeth going to marry, which was the biggest question of the day. And particularly through the concerns of Robert Dudley, who uh, hoped that that person would be him. <laughs> and when it wasn't, tried you know, to do whatever he could to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that it, it, it wouldn't be someone else. And, and you know, Lester was, was uh, sort of famous for using writers to make his case for him. And, and he would stage these plays at court and at the inns of court. And he would have, you know, his, his nephew, Philip Sidney, write these tracts against, you know, marrying the French Duke of, Al of Alençon. And um, so McCarthy started seeing the same thing in, in Shakespeare's plays through, um, through the particular time and concerns of, of Thomas North. Uh, for example, in the 1560s, when Elizabeth was uh, considering marrying Eric the Fourteenth of Sweden, McCarthy believes that uh, Thomas North wrote an, uh, an early version of Titus Andronicus, in which the villain is uh, Tamora, Queen of the Goths, and when she marries the Roman Emperor, sort of everything uh, goes goes wrong. And now Eric mm. the Fourteenth of Sweden was also known as as Eric the Fourteenth, King of Sweden and the Goths. So there's a mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of direct, mm -hmm. direct, you know, reference there. And, and what was fascinating was that it wasn't the only place he, he was able to find this. Um, but in the 1570s, when she was considering Don John of Austria, who is the bastard brother of Philip II, the villain of Much Ado About Nothing is Don John the Bastard. And he gets his mm. comeuppance in the end. <laughs> and then in the 1580s, when she was considering the Duke of Alençon, uh, uh, Henry the Sixth, Part One. There's actually a villain in that play who's a, sort of an ancestor, who's actually named the Duke of Alençon, and he is sort of bested by this English hero Talbot, who was actually an ancestor of Leicester. And so mm. it's almost like he was sort of playing out on stage this, uh, you know, this marriage question that was playing out in court and and making the case for for Leicester and in, in, in uh, you know in opposition to these other other uh, rulers. Uh, these other uh, marriage prospects. And what's particularly fascinating is if you look at these references, which sort of seem so obvious when you look at them that way, they really don't make any sense when you apply them in the 1590s when Shakespeare was writing and Don John and, and Alan Psalm were dead and, and Eric the 14th had gone mad. And so there was really sort of no reason to put these characters in the plays as a throwback to these, you know, villains from another time. But if you, if you look at it in terms of being based on these source plays that were written decades earlier, suddenly everything falls mm -hmm. into place. And it's just this real aha moment. That Kenilworth Festival, which, you know, some scholars actually see as being the inspiration for Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, mm -hmm. they, you know, can't for the life of them figure out sort of how Shakespeare could have witnessed it because he was only 10 years old at the time. And, you know, maybe his father brought him from Stratford. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Tom, we know Thomas North's brother was actually there at the festival and most likely Thomas was, was there with him. So there's right. another connection. Right, to see the mermaid up on the dolphin's back, that beautiful <laughs> right. reference. But yes, right. would, would a 10-year-old even, you know, think that way? So that's great. And I love little details like that that give us some pointers. 
So then there's another favorite of Elizabeth later in her reign, the Earl of Essex. Right. And North gets um, involved in that too. So tell us about that. So he just seems to, again, just like his father, this thread goes throughout Elizabeth's reign. So tell us a little right. bit about that. Yeah. And this is a little bit murkier, but uh, it seems that after Lester's death, for a time at least, Thomas North was a part of the Earl of Essex's circle. And it even seems like he fought with him in France and, and was knighted by him uh, on the battlefield. So that's why we, we now call him Sir Thomas North. But um, at some point, he must have had a, a falling out because when uh, Essex staged his own rebellion against Queen Elizabeth, this sort of very ill-fated attempt mm -hmm. uh, in 1601, um, North was actually... Um, appears in the record books as one of the primary people who helped put down the rebellion. And in fact, he's the first one on the list and he's given the highest reward of anyone uh, who's, who's mentioned in, in the record books, but there's no other information about what exactly he did. And so, you know, one of, one of the speculations that, that McCarthy has made is that uh, there might be some connection to the fact that Richard II uh, was mm -hmm. sort of famously staged on the on the eve of the rebellion as as sort of a way to rally the people to arms with this play about this deposed king. Mm -hmm. And uh, so so McCarthy speculates that maybe, you know, because Thomas North was close to the theater, maybe he tipped off Queen Elizabeth or the authorities uh, to this uh, this play that was being performed and and, you know, helped them. Uh, sort of raise their their response to the rebellion, and again, you know, I don't want to get too far afield. There's no there's no direct evidence of that, but it's just really sort of opens up this this just fascinating speculation about how uh, theater and and politics were intertwined, and and yes. how once again Thomas North seems to be right at the center of it. Well, that's great because I think that the story of the Essex Rebellion and Richard II and the Queen later saying, I am Richard II, no, right. you're not that. So that connection does remind us of the powerful and really palpable impact of theater on politics right up to the Queen. She definitely felt threatened by that. Right, right. And, and when we look at the rebellion and how quickly it fell apart... And yet she really felt threatened by that. Of course, by the end of her reign, she was, um, you know, her friends were dying and she had lost a lot of her power. But still, the enormous power of theater and the impact yeah. that could have as a way of expressing ideas, which, you know, apart from the North connection, but then does really, I think, reinforce that idea that someone who had been at the heart of politics through his family and through his training and his experiencing his experiences at the ends of court would have been so well poised to use the power of theater right. to make some of his points. Right. So I just find that fascinating right up to that very late event in the reign of Elizabeth. So let's try to bring it together if we can. Of all the things we've talked about, What's a takeaway you would like a reader to have? Wow. Um, well, I think that for me, what what I got most out of out of reading the out of writing the book was this opportunity to just really immerse myself in a different time and place. It had just its own unique concerns and preoccupations that have somehow filtered into this these great works of literature that we're still reading today. And I, in the course of writing this book, I reread uh, dozens of Shakespeare plays and, and I, I read dozens of his of books about uh, Elizabethan history. And it was just so fascinating to me to be able to see kind of how history and literature engaged and then apply it to our current moment as well. And, and to think about, you know, how the more mm -hmm. things change, the more, the more they stay the same. And we still have the, you know, Henry the Ace and, and Elizabeth <laughs> running around in our current <laughs> political system. And, and we still have, uh, you know, uh -huh. uh, artistic uh, and creative enterprises, whether it's Saturday Night Live or, 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 you know, movies and, right. and, uh, uh, plays that are being produced today that are that are commenting on it, and so uh, you know, outside, you know, the biggest kind of takeaway was for me was just to to look at this kind of fascinating interplay between between history and politics and and literature, and uh, 
and and really be able to see that in a new way through this really fascinating character of, of Thomas North and and this fascinating character of Dennis McCarthy that I was able to spend spend time some time with writing this book. Well, we want to thank you for spending time with Thomas North, spending time with McCarthy, and especially spending time with us here on the podcast. Thank you, Michael, for being here. Once again, Michael's book is North by Shakespeare, A Rogue Scholar's Quest to Discover the Truth Behind the Bard's Work. It is available now. You can learn more about Michael and his other work on his website, michaelblanding.com, as well as social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and on Goodreads. And thank you for spending April shaking up Shakespeare. Now, we have mothers, grandmothers, and all kinds of family drama ahead. So get ready for more Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. And let's keep shaking up history together.